Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read Moby Dick. And we are getting ever so close to the to actually finishing Moby Dick. Can you believe it? We're only a few episodes away. So, let's get going. Chapter 135. The Chase. Third Day. The morning of the third day dawned, fair and fresh, and once more the solitary nightman at the foremast head was relieved by crowds of the daylight lookouts, who dotted every mast and almost every spar. <coughs> Do you see him? cried Ahab, but the whale was not yet in sight. In his infallible wake, though, but follow that wake, that's all. Helm there. Steady as, th as thou go goest, and hast been going. What a lovely day again! Were it a new-made world, and made for a summer house to the angels, and this morning the first of its throwing open to them, a fairer day could not dawn upon that world. Here's food for thought. Had Ahab time to think? But Ahab never thinks. He only feels. Feels, feels. That's tingling enough for mortal man. To thinks the audacity. God only has that right and privilege. Thinking is, or ought to be, a coolness and a calmness, and our poor hearts throb, and our poor brains beat too much for that. And yet I've sometimes thought my brain was very calm, frozen calm, this old skull cracks so, like a glass in which the contents turned to ice and shiver it. And still this hair is growing now, this moment growing, and heat must breed it. But no, it's like that sort of common grass that will grow anywhere, between the earthly clefts of greenless, Greenland ice, or in Vesuvius lava. How the wild winds blow it, they whip it about me, as the torn shreds of split sails lash the tossed ship they cling to. A vile wind that has no doubt blown air, this through prison corridors and cells, and wards of hospitals, and ventilated them, and now comes blowing hither as innocent as fleeces. Out upon it, it's tainted. Were I the wind, I'd blow no more on such a wicked, miserable world. I'd crawl somewhere to a cave and slink there. And yet tis a noble and heroic thing, the wind, whoever conquered it. In every fight it has the last and bitterest blow. Run tilting at it, and you would but run through it. Ha! A coward wind that strikes stark naked men, but will not stand to receive a single blow. Even Ahab is a braver thing, a nobler thing than that. Would now the wind but had a body, but all the things that most exasperate and outrage mortal man, all these things are bodiless, but only bodiless as objects, not as agents. There's a most special, a most cunning, oh, a most malicious difference. And yet, I say again, and so will swear it now, that there's something all glorious and gracious in the wind. These warm trade winds, at least, that in the clear heavens blow straight on, in strong and steadfast, vigorous mildness, and veer not from their mark, however the, the base occurrence of the sea may turn and tack and mightiest Mississippis of the land swift and swerve about, uncertain where to go at last. And by the eternal poles, these same trades that so directly blow my good ship on, these trades, or something like them, something so unchangeable and full as strong, blow my keeled soul along. To it, aloft there, what do you see? Nothing, sir, nothing, and noon at hand, the doubloon goes a-begging. See the sun? Aye, aye, it must be so. I've over-sailed him. How? Got the start? Aye, he's chasing me now. Not I, him. That's bad. I might have known it, too. Fool, the lines, the harpoons he's towing. Aye, aye, I have run him by last night. About, about, come down, all of ye. But the regular lookouts man the braces. Steering as she had done, the wind had been somewhat on the Pequod's quarter, 
so that now being pointed in the reverse direction, the braced ship sailed hard upon the breeze as she returned to the cream in her own white wake. Against the wind he now steers for the open jaw, murmured Starbuck to himself, as he coiled the new hauled main brace upon the rail. God keep us! But already my bones feel damp within me, and from inside wet my flesh. I misdoubt me that I disobey my God in obeying him. Stand by to sway me up, cried Ahab, advancing to the hempen basket. We should meet him soon. Aye, aye, sir, and straight away Starbuck did Ahab's bidding, and once more Ahab swung up on high. <clears throat> A whole hour now passed, gold beaten out to ages. Time itself now held long breaths with keen suspense. But at last, some three points off the weather bow, Ahab descried the spout again, and instantly from the three mastheads three shrieks went up as if the tongues of fire had voiced it. Forehead to forehead I meet thee, this third time, Moby Dick. On deck there, brace sharper up, crowd her into the wind's eye. He's too far off to lower yet, Mr. Starbuck. The sail sh shake, stand over that helmsman with a top maul. So, so, he travels fast and I must down. But let me have one more good round look aloft, here at the sea. There's time for that. An old, old sight, and yet somehow so young. Aye, and not changed a wink since I first saw it. A boy from the sand hills of Nantucket. The same, the same, the same to Noah as to me. There's a soft shower to leeward. Such lovely leewardings. They must lead somewhere, to something else than common land, more palmy than the palms. Leeward, the white whale goes that way. Look to windward, then. The better if the, if the bitter a quarter. But good-bye, good-bye, old masthead. What's this? Green? Aye, tiny mosses in these warped cracks. No such green weather stains on Ahab's head. There's the difference now between man's old age and matters. But aye, old mass, we both grow old together, sound in our hulls, Though, are we not, my ship? I minus a leg, that's all. By heaven this deadwood has the better of my life flesh every day. Uh, every, every way, sorry. I can't comp compare with it, and I've known some ships made of dead trees outlast the lives of men, made of the most vital stuff of vital fathers. What's that, he said? He should still go before me, my pilot, and yet to be seen again. But where? Will I have eyes at the bottom of the sea, supposing I descend those endless stairs? And all night I'd been sailing from him. Wherever did he sink to? Aye, aye, like many more thou toldst direful truth as touching thyself, O Parsee. But Ahab, there thy shot fell short. Goodbye, masthead. Keep a good eye upon the whale, the while I'm gone. We'll talk tomorrow, nay. Tonight, when the white whale lies down there, tied by head and tail. He gave the word, and still gazing round him, was steadily lowered through the coven blue air to the deck. In due time the boats were lowered, but as standing in his shallop stern, Ahab just hovered upon the point of the descent. He waved to the mate, who held one of the tackle ropes on deck, and bade him pause. Starbuck. Sir, for the third time my soul's ship starts upon this voyage, Starbuck. Aye, sir, thou wilt have it so. Some ships sail from their ports, and ever afterwards are missing, Starbuck. Truth, sir, saddest truth. Some men die at ebb tide, some at low water, some at the full of the flood. And I feel now like a billow that's all one crested comb, Starbuck. I am old. Shake hands with me, man. Their hands met, their eyes fastened. Starbucks tears the glue. Oh, my captain, my captain. Noble heart, go not, go not. See, it's a brave man that weeps. How great the agony of the persuasion then. Lower away, cried Ahab.
tossing the mate's arm from him. Stand by the crew. <clears throat> In an instant, the boat was pulling round, close under the stern. The sharks, the sharks, cried a voice from the low cabin window there. Oh, master, my master, come back. But Ahab heard nothing, for his own voice was high lifted then, and the boat le leaped on. Yet the voice spake true, for scarce had he pushed from the ship when numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out the dark waters beneath the hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars every time they dipped in the water, and in this way accompanied the boat with their bites. It is a thing not uncommonly happening to the whaleboats in those swarming seas, the sharks at times apparently following them in the same prescient prescient way that vultures hover over the banners of marching regiments in the east. But these were the first sharks that had been observed by the Pequods since the white whale had been descried. And whether it was that Ahab's crew were all such tiger-yellow barbarians, and therefore their flesh more musky to the senses of the sharks, a, some, a matter sometimes well known to affect them. However it was, they seemed to follow that one boat without molesting the others. And with that, we're going to end the episode there, because there is a fair chunk of this chapter left. So I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.